Today on Between the Lines, how to help your children heal and become stronger with Dr. Judith Simon Prager. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Dr. Prager was a past guest on Between the Lines with her groundbreaking book, The Worst is Over. Today she takes the lessons learned from that work and now applies it specifically to children. With her latest book, Verbal First Aid, she explores how words spoken to your child in times of crisis not only helps them heal, but gets them through the difficulties they encounter later in life. But I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth. In, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the person who did. Judith, what a pleasure to see you again. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. This is one of my favorite places to be. Uh, well, you know, I was telling you, and, and I am not joking, your first book that was here, The Worst is Over, is one of the most important books we've discussed here and because and, and this by the way is a continuation of it so it's wonderful and the people will see why it is so important because it literally was a book as this is about words that can save your life what more can I ask for it's a very inexpensive tool that anyone can have. I, you know, I called the Boy Scouts the other day. I hope they'll be willing to, to use this new book. But I said to them, this is literally be prepared. <laughs> you don't have to do anything except know the right thing to say. But you also want us to know that it's not knowing the right thing to say, but how you say it. That is, and in fact, you even go one step further. You even say, touch sometimes without any words, as long as that empathy is there, mm -hmm. that's again the, one of the keys to verbal first aid. That's how we, it's nonverbal, but it's presence is healing. I had a woman in my office the other day and she started crying and I said, what's happening with you? And she said, you're really listening. <laughs> I, well, I'm a therapist, I get paid to do that, but it meant that she never had that experience of somebody really listening. There's nothing more healing than presence. I want to give a quick little summation of what this is about. What this really is about is how to approach a young person, whether it's your own child or just, just a young person. And by the way, it translates to young if you're a young 60-year-old. Just for the record, everything that you're going to be saying to a young person, except possibly the actual words, it's the same type of advice you would use for anyone else. But it is what you say to them in a crisis that could be a physical crisis, an emergency. You even go into it as far as covering ranges from uh, someone's death to bedwetting. But it is what you say, how you are going to say it, that not only helps that person get through that moment, but this was what was so different from the worst is over. You're coming out here and saying it has a lasting effect on their life for the existence that they're here. What is trauma? Trauma is the memory of something that happened that seems terrible at the moment. If you can change how it feels in the moment while it's happening, you change the memory of it. And we say, we say that with verbal first aid, this one, for that when you're speaking to kids, you can turn a scare into a comfort and a hurt into a healing, and a potential trauma into a memory of courage. What could be better? Well, you know, I, I very rarely ask to give examples, and there's tons of examples here, but one that you give that just keeps sticking in my mind is a grandpa running up to a young girl uh, who's just scraped her knee, and, or, or something of that nature, and, and how you can approach a person two different ways that affect it. And I have, because I read your book, I have experimented with this and I have seen it. It is amazing. If you jump up there and you go, oh my God, what's wrong? That poor person all of a sudden starts to cry. She gets so, but if you go in there and, and, and you're almost smiling and you go, oh, that kind of happened to me one time and I remember how good I healed. It is amazing 
what happens right then and there. That's right, that's right. Well, we say it with older people. If, if you know, Grandpa falls down and grabs his heart and you say to him, Grandpa, don't die, what does he hear? Die? Could I die? And his heart palpitates and, and everything goes haywire. The different chemicals go through his body. That's what we say about verbal first aid. Every thought that you have has a physiological reaction. So different chemicals go through your body depending on whether you're feeling calm and uh, you know your, your endorphins are kicking in to help you or something has frightened you so much further that your adrenaline and your cortisol run rampant and as a result your physiology changes. So this isn't just to make a person feel better like I'm here and it's very I'm being calm but we're changing the direction of healing. We're actually changing the way your body responds to it. Let's give the viewers just a, a brief overview of, of some of the key issues here. So the, the first thing is and, and let's use the, because it's verbal first aid, let's use a first aid situation and, and we'll get into the other ways later on. But the first thing you tell the responder, the person who's going to respond to this, is they've got to, well I'll use your words exactly, center yourself. You must calm yourself down and the first thing 99.9% .9 of the time is take a deep breath. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know why? Two reasons why taking a breath is really important. One is it brings you into present time. Otherwise, you may be thinking of your last trauma. You may be thinking of future consequences. You can't. You have to be present so that you can be helpful. But the other is when we're in panic, when we're frightened, when you see your child bleeding and you suddenly go into this fight or flight, the blood goes from your prefrontal cortex where you are logical and intelligent to your primitive survival brain. And also, so you're not logical and also you start to breathe shallowly. When you breathe shallowly, when you're frightened, and not enough blood gets to your, not enough oxygen gets to your brain. If not enough oxygen gets to your brain, your brain panics and you begin to shallow breathe. So there's no way out of that trap except to take a deep breath, get more oxygen to your brain, and you can start to get clearer, you can start to be in present time, and you can start to remember the words to say that can set a course for healing for the person you love. You know, it's funny, uh, I was witnessing when, when my mother-in-law uh, had a stroke and I was outside waiting for the paramedics and I even noticed, I was, uh, at first I was annoyed, they didn't seem to be moving fast enough and I remember you saying that all of them now <laughs> practically use the worst is over techniques <laughs> and I realized what they were doing was they were centering themselves, they were taking the breath, they were getting ready, they were making sure they wouldn't fall. You must care for yourself before you can care for that other person. Well, you know, they say that on the airlines and, and when they say if the oxygen comes down and you're traveling with a child, put it on yourself first. And every mother on the plane is saying, no, no, I'll put it on my child first. You know, I'm not as important. But of course, if you can't breathe, how can you help anybody else? So you, you make sure you're all right. And step number one, you're right, is center yourself before you deal with an emergency. Then you say, do a self-check. What, give us an example of a self-check. So you, you've taken your deep breath, you've centered yourself, you're still, you know, you're, you're acting, you're not necessarily just, you know, by the way, you're not doing this in the corner while your child is bleeding. <laughs> All of this is happening at the same time. The self-check, what are you going through at well, that you point? Well, know, you know, your child, children are a separate market altogether, a separate uh, a separate way of being. The Worst is Over was written for first responders to help everyone. This verbal first aid book is about children and children learn about the world from adults. We are, they say in loco dies, in place of God, we tell them how the world works. If it, uh, You mentioned it before, if a, ch if a child is hurt, what's the first thing he or she does? Look to the mother or father to see if they should cry. How bad is this? So when you do a self-check, you say, what am I presenting to this child? Am I, am I all right? Can I come to this in a calm way? You know, we have an example of the nosebleed, and the nosebleed is a really funny thing. It, it, everybody gets nosebleeds. It's not a terrible thing, but if you walk into the bedroom and there is your little sweet Emily on the bed, and her shirt is covered in blood, and it looks like Friday the 13th, the first experience that you have, even after you take a breath, is that you want to go over and say, oh my God, you're bleeding, you're bleeding. So you have to remember, you have to hold on to yourself and walk in and say, and, and name it for her, you're having a nosebleed. Everybody has a nosebleed. You know, Uncle George used to have nosebleeds like every other Wednesday and we'd all, you know, and we knew what to do and this is what we do. And then you start doing the process, which is this physical 
first aid as well. Of course, you sit with the child, you tilt the child forward so that it doesn't swallow the blood, you hold the nose, and you, and you say to the child, would you like me to hold your nose while we hold it tight so it stops bleeding, or do you want to hold it yourself? And then we start giving the verbal first aid techniques, like imagining that you have a faucet and you could actually turn off the blood. By the way, that part was amazing to me. You have proven over and over again that you can, with words and consciousness, I'm not stop. Let's say certain types of bleeding. I mean, we have to be careful here. I'm assuming you know you get shot with a bazooka <laughs> in the gut. It's going to be very difficult to do. But certain types of blood flow you can stop. That's true. In fact, um, people with uh, what is it called when you you can't stop bleeding? H hemophilia. Thank you. People with hemophilia have been uh, experiments have been done where they've been hypnotized to tell them that they won't bleed when they have dental work, and that's worked too. But you are in that altered state, which is almost like hypnosis when you're in fear and crisis. So every word is like a hypnotic suggestion. And with children, they are in that state all the time, especially under the age of six. 